discrete time sampling can be thought of in a very similar way to continuous time sampling. So let's assume we have this waveform here. It's a discrete time signal. Uh, it only exists at integer values. That's what discrete time means. And if we wanted to sample this and only store a compressed version of it, uh, which often happens in image processing uh, and other forms of compression, then what we might like to do is to uh, only keep a regular uh, set of these. And here's how we do it. We can multiply Xn times Pn. Pn is called the sampling waveform. And it's often written like this, and uh, it's important that we understand what this means to in graphical terms. So let's look at that. So what is this function here? It's a sum of delta functions, each one shifted by k times capital N. Uh, so let's do an example when N capital N equals 3. So that means we're only going to keep every third sample from our original signal. And one way to do that is we set all the other ones equal to 0, and we do that by multiplying. Let's see. So this delta function here exists at k with all the sums k equals 0, we've got delta n, so that's this one here. Uh, at k equals 1, we've got 1 times 3, so we've got a delta function at 3, and we've got a delta function at k equals 2, that's 2 times 3 is 6, and they're all of height 1. So we have these delta functions, uh, which this function here is 0 otherwise, so it's zero in between. And that's what this function looks like. And this is our sampling function. We're going to multiply our signal times this function. Of course, it's going to set all these ones to zero wherever there's a zero here. And it's going to keep these ones because they're multiplied by one. So here's our waveform that we get from multiplying by that function. So we've sampled it and we've got our zeros in between. And we'd like to know what that does for in the, uh, in the Fourier domain. So here's our sampled signal and we can now, if we wanted to store this efficiently, we could get rid of those zeros and just store the values. We know that they only happen every three and we could store the heights of these values here. It would be a much more efficient way of storing the signal. But we we're interested to know whether we could recover this signal. And so let's see if we think we can do that. So let's consider a Fourier transform of this signal. Let's assume it's a low pass signal and it might have a shape that looks something like this. It's symmetric and it has a maximum frequency. And we know that in discrete time, the basis functions repeat themselves. And so there's a copies of these up at two pi and four pi and minus two pi and so on. So this is a property that we know because the basis functions in discrete time, they repeat. So this is a typical, it would be a typical Fourier transform of a signal that looks like this if it's band pass, if it's low pass. So what about the Fourier transform of this? Well, we know that the Fourier transform of this, we're not going to do it in this uh, video, but we know that the Fourier transform of this function is a series of delta functions. And they are spaced, in this case because n equals 3, they are, again, they, they repeat. So there's a delta function at 0. There's also a delta function at 2 pi because they repeat. And for n equals 3, there's also delta functions at 2 pi on 3 and 4 pi on 3. And of course, they're symmetric and they repeat. So the delta functions repeat. So this is the Fourier transform of this P e to the j omega, we, we write, this is x e to the j omega, indicating it's a Fourier transform of a discrete time signal. So, as of course we know, we multiply in the time domain, means we convolve in the frequency domain, and when we convolve a signal with a delta function, the signal moves to be centered on the place of the delta function. So in this case, this whole waveform is going to move to be centered on each one of these delta functions. And so what we get then is this here, this one centered on this. When this one's on here, we're getting components of these ones up here, of course, as well. Then, of course, when this one is shifted up to here, we're getting those components there. And you can see that we're going to end up with 
this function here. And this is our sample. All of these are supposed to be the same. I'm just sketching them. My drawing isn't very accurate, uh, but you can see uh, here um, the final Fourier transform. So this is the Fourier transform of our sample discrete time waveform. Of course it's continuous because we know that the Fourier transforms of discrete time signals are continuous in frequency because the discrete time signals can represent any frequency. They're not necessarily just discrete frequencies. And we get this function here. And so the question we were asking it before is if we've stored it like this, can we recover the original signal? Well, if the maximum frequency in our signal is less than twice the this sampling rate here, so it's less than, in this case, 2 pi on 3, as long as Wm is less than, uh, or 2 times Wm is less than 2 pi on 3, then we will be able to recover it. So in general, if Ws equals 2 pi on, oh, sorry, Ws which does equal 2 pi on n, if that is bigger than twice the maximum frequency component of your signal, then you will be able to recover because these will not overlap and that means that when you've stored this, you could go back to this one by multiplying by, in the frequency domain, by a square function which zeroes out all the intermediate copies and you would recover this version here. And the way to do that multiplication in the frequency domain is to implement a filter in the time domain that has that ideal low pass nature. So an ideal low pass filter would be able to recover the original signal if you've sampled at a rate that satisfies this equation.